Hello guys and welcome back to the channel and to another one of my based on a true story. This is a series this week rather than a movie because we have a series in, on TV in the UK that's just been released called The Man, His Wife and the Canoe which stars one of my favourite actors Eddie Marsden. This is one I really really suggest you check out if you can. If you're in the UK it is on the ITV hub to watch at the moment. Um, and this is actually a true story, which is a really, really surprising one. So it's one that I definitely wanted to cover for the channel. So if you want to know the true story behind the series, stick around. So this story follows a gentleman called John Darwin. He actually was born in 1950 and for 18 years of his life, he taught science and mathematics. He left there to go to work for Barclays and shortly after that, he went on to work as a prison guard, which at the time of the story that we're talking is what he was still doing. His wife Anne was Anne Stevenson and they married in December 1973. Um, she was a doctor's receptionist which again um, as the story happens is what she was doing in her career. So as well as working for the prison service and Anne working as a doctor's receptionist the couple also rented out bed sits. They had bought 12 properties which they used to rent to get the income from that to live on also. But business, unfortunately, was not very good for the couple. And following buying a couple of properties in the year 2000, things just took a massive slump. And the couple ended up with very, very substantial debts. Debts that would not be something that they realistically could probably pay back. Now, any other person would declare bankruptcy. And this was something that was discussed between the couple. But John decided basically over his dead body and that would become a very relevant expression. He told his wife Anne that he would rather top himself is how he put it. He would rather not be here than have to declare bankruptcy, than have to have the world know that he was a failure, that he failed at looking after his family. They had two sons. By this stage, they were both grown up and moved away from home. It was a very upsetting time for John and Anne. They had bailiffs coming to the door regularly. They were having to avoid answering the door. They were having to not answer the telephone. It was just a time of constant worry and stress for the two of them. Now, Anne was a very typical, normal housewife. John did seem to have delusions of grandeur, did seem to think that he was above Anne, that he was more intelligent than Anne, um, and that he would be able to get himself out of any situation. But the idea that John would come up with next to get them out of their financial difficulty is one that no sane person would attempt. So John's big idea was to fake his own death and for his wife to claim the life insurance on his behalf. Um, as a young man, John had been a skilled canoer. He liked kayak. He hadn't in many, many years. And he felt as they lived close to the sea, a good idea would be for him to be seen going out to sea in his kayak and for him not to return. The plan was for him to go into the sea, to follow the coastline around for a few miles and to then, at a secluded spot, come back out of the sea and maybe camp somewhere until such times as Anne could come and pick him up and they would make the next decision from there. And that is indeed what the couple went on to do. So on the 21st of March 2002, John set off in the morning with a kayak under his arm, ensuring that he was seen by individuals that would be able to say, yeah, I saw him, I saw him with a canoe under his arm. John was reported missing by his work after failing to show, and a large-scale sea search was immediately commenced. They actually searched 62 square miles looking for John along all the coastline, and to no avail they didn't find him. They did, however, the following day find his paddle, which was broken, and later that same evening, on the 22nd of March 2002, they found the wreckage of John's kayak, and obviously came to the same conclusion that everyone else did, that John had run into difficulty and he had succumbed to the ocean. It was said by some rescuers, however, that the North Sea at that particular time was unusually calm, so they were not entirely sure how John had run into difficulty. It was discussed that perhaps he had had a stroke, had a heart attack and had drowned. But um, there doesn't really seem to have been at that stage any questions asked, no suspicion was aroused. John was very simply suspected to have met his end at sea. 
So for the next stage of John's plan, after successfully managing to have everyone feel that he had drowned at sea, where should he go next? Where other than next door to his very own old address with his wife? He moved into the bedsit next door to his old house. Yes, ridiculous I know, but that this is what he did. He felt it would be the last place I would be looking for him. There were connecting doors within his home to the next door so he was able to come and go into his wife's house. So John stayed next door to his wife for quite a while, obviously coming and going through the house before moving in finally in February 2003 with his wife, obviously still completely unknown to everyone else. A death certificate was issued for his death, um, which is said to have been on the 21st of March 2002, and this allowed his wife to claim, it is said, £250,000 on life insurance for John. Now in the series it does say that she had difficulty with this because the ruling is you must wait for seven years um, after a person has gone missing. Um, obviously everyone did say that he had died at sea but because the body was never recovered she was told by the insurance company that she would have to continue to pay insurance premiums for seven years um, before she could actually claim on his death. Now this is what they said in the series. I'm not entirely sure if this is the reality but in the series she had to go to court and um, had to basically convince the, the judge that in order for her and her sons to move on she needed to have that death certificate and this is something she was very much manipulated into by John. Um, I do feel this probably is what happened. Um, John does come across as a very manipulative, very he uses and he sort of he does what he can to get her to perform his bidding. She did not initially want to go along with this um, idea but he told her, well, if you won't help me, then I suppose I'll have to do it for real. The only way we're going to get out of this financial hole that we're in is for me to kill myself and for you to claim the insurance. So her choice was go along with my husband's completely harebrained scheme. <clears throat> now, remember, they have two sons. And for this to work, she had to have her sons believe that their father was dead, that he drowned at sea. So she could do this, which she didn't want to do, or she could allow, or she thought allow her husband to go and commit suicide to enable her to collect the money. And she decided to support him, although in the series it's very much put across that she did not want to do this, she was not happy with this. It was very much coercive control on the part of her husband. Um, but he managed, he moved next door. He then moved into her and the couple managed to claim £250,000 in life insurance money. Obviously then there is the 12 rental properties that they owned and was able to sell these off individually and have the money from that also. Now something happened that could have caused something of a bump in the road for John. He was actually recognised by the tenant from one of the bedsit blocks. He was by the name of Lee Wadrop and he spotted John and said, aren't you supposed to be dead? Now John didn't deny it was him, he just said don't tell anyone about this and Lee Wadrop didn't. Um, he was to say later that he just did not want to get involved in whatever the situation was so John's secret remained safe. So fast forward to 2004 and John applied for a passport successfully under the name John Jones and he actually gave his real home address when getting this passport. This was never flagged up by anyone. He travelled to Cyprus looking at potentially buying property there for him and his wife to go into business and um, his wife then flew out later that same year for them to scout the area to see if there was anywhere suitable for them to purchase. Over the next few years they would look into different places, nothing really ever seemed to properly fit. Um, everything was going on as normal, John was living in the house, he was flitting back and forth between next door and his wife's house. And while he was at home, obviously he couldn't go out, he was spending an awful lot of time on the internet. And on the internet he was actually to meet a woman from Kansas in America. At one stage he actually flew out to meet her. Now it mustn't have gone well because never really any detail has gone into as to what happened. He flew straight back and then flew straight back out again to Gibraltar. And then from Gibraltar to El Puerto de Santa Maria view a £45,000 catamaran that he was considering buying. This man is just arrogant, knows no ends. I mean, he's done this, he's got away with it, he's cleared his debt. And he wants to buy a £45,000 catamaran after having travelled to America to visit some woman that he has been having an online affair with. 
her Anne. But John's game would be up soon. It's 14th of July 2006 and he flies out to Panama with a view of again checking out some property and this is the one that they do go into in the series. They go to visit a property agent, him and Anne, and they're actually photographed by this property agent, stood side by side with one of the property agents, and this photograph is placed on the internet. At no stage did John and Anne think that potentially this photograph could pop up and um, could be their downfall. So Panama definitely did seem to appeal to John and Anne because the following year, in March 2007, they returned to Panama and they formed a company called Jaguar Properties. This was so they could buy a two-bed apartment in El Dorado for £50,000. Back home, the bed set home next to the family home was sold and the proceeds were sent to his son Mark and Mark then transferred all the funds out to the account in Panama. Um, by any account, the sons were probably really confused as to what their mum was doing. They'd lost their dad. Their mum just seemed to this like really shy, retiring, very dull, normal housewife. Had just started going on all these foreign holidays and spending all this money. And now she had decided to start a new life on her own in Panama. So her sons believed. But they went with it. They wanted their mum to be happy. They helped with the sale of properties and the sale of the bed set. And they transferred the funds as they were asked. So after the sale of the bed set, Anne returns home to the UK in order to sell the family home. And in May 2007, he purchased a £200,000 estate um, in an area called Escobar, which was near the Panama Canal. The intention was for him and Anne to build a hotel on the property to be able to offer like canoeing holidays, like adventure holidays. Now, John later actually denied this was the case. He said that this was invented, that what they were going to do with the land. He said the media had invented the canoeing thing as a romanticism based around him obviously going missing in the canoe and that that had never been the intention. But um, who knows? Um, to all due purposes, it did look like that's what they wanted to do. And the series definitely does depict this. He had in his mind like this like tropical retreat where people could come and jet ski, canoe, could do all these like adventurous things at the holiday home that they would build. Meanwhile, back at home, September of that same year, 2007, the police are actually starting an investigation into John Darwin because a colleague of Anne's has actually overheard her having a conversation with John on the phone and she becomes suspicious. Now, it's not clear if she knew this was John. This is actually left out of the documentary. This is never raised as being the reason that the, the ruse is discovered, but the police have started their investigation at this stage back home. So the following month, October 2007, Anne sells the family home successfully for £295,000. John at this stage is still in Panama. After the sale of the house, she returns and they held a day together in Costa Rica for a while before returning to Panama. The, the, this, this is the life. Now, at this stage, John tells Anne that he's really missing his sons and she buys him a ticket back to the UK. I don't know what he thinks he's going to do. His sons think he's deceased, but... Um, at this stage, this is where John finds that there has been a recent change in the law in Panama. And in order for them to own property and to have the visas that they need, they need to be able to provide proof from their local police constabulary about them, their character, their identity. And obviously John's identity is fake. He doesn't exist to the police and his real identity is of a person that is no longer with us. So the dream, the £200,000 plot of land that's been purchased with the mind of building that dream hotel is all suddenly dashed. Um, what on earth are the couple going to do now? So if you didn't think the whole thing was mad to this point, John's next plot is something straight out of a film script. John decides that because they can't proceed with their plan and everything that, ha that he has done has just gone to pot, he decides that he is going to return to the UK and he is going to fake amnesia. And indeed in December 2007, John walks into the police station in the West End of London and he says that he has no memory of anything for the past five years of his life. So obviously um, John's sons are elated their father has survived. They don't have any questions at this stage. They're just delighted to see their father. Anne is in Panama. She has a phone call from the authorities and she has to feign complete elation that her husband has survived. Shock, surprise. But she knows the phone call's coming. She's sitting waiting on that phone call. 
I don't know if the police were suspicious at this stage, but I do know that they had an investigation going on for three months prior to this as to what was going on. It was highlighted by Anne's colleague with her claim in the insurance, being a bit iffy about a telephone conversation, her holidays, her trips to Panama. Um, I think this colleague had kind of put two and two together. Now, while all this is happening, something is published in the newspaper. A member of the public had put into Google, John, Anne and Panama. And what had come back was that photograph taken at that property agents of John, as bold as brass stood there with his wife, Anne, and the date of the photograph is on the photograph and when they were in the agents at the stage obviously that John is meant to be dead. He's meant to have been dead for several years and the story broke all over the newspapers in the UK. It, that photograph was front page news. Everyone was talking about this man from the north of England that had faked his own death and had gone to the sunny climate of Panama with his wife to start again um, and John's plan was just blown wide open. It's thought that Anne, and though definitely in the series, Anne did definitely try to lie initially. Her and John had had a backup story in case um, they'd been discovered, where they were to say that um, initially he did have amnesia, but he hadn't had amnesia for the past couple of years. So that initial canoe accident was was real, and he was trying to explain his the fact he was in Panama. They discovered the fake passport. The fake passport name, the John Jones, was a baby that had actually died in the year 1950 when John was born and he had taken that identity and that's what he'd been using. His sons, initially completely elated at the news of their father's return, obviously found out the truth. Their mother eventually did concede after trying to lie that, yep, that was him in the photograph, she told the truth, she told what had happened and the sons were just distraught. They went on TV, they said they felt they'd been the subject of a scam by their own parents, which they had. Um, initially, people were suspicious of the sons, thought they may have been involved, they must have been involved. What parents would do this to their own children? But indeed, over the years, it has been proven that the sons were in no way involved. Um, they were as much a victim of what had happened as any other individual that had been told a relative had died. So Anne obviously had to return from Panama to the UK where she was arrested at Heathrow Airport and taken into custody. So eventually they both go to court for a multitude of different crimes. I could be here all day reading you out the crimes, the individual money that they got from their life insurance, from the properties, um, fraudulently obtaining money that they had no right to have, John obtaining the false passport. There were a lot of different crimes, but unfortunately for Anne, even though this very much had been John's baby, it had been his plan, she was guilty of more crimes than he was because he was not the one that had applied for the actual money for the life insurance. Anne actually ended up, after all the trials had been over, she ended up receiving six years and six months in prison. John received six years and three months, so Anne actually ended up serving three months longer than John for the crime. Um, in prison, initially they were still together, but... Anne received counselling when she was in prison and realised and came to terms with the course of control that she was subjected to by her husband and she decided during her time in prison that she wanted to separate and divorce from John which was not something that went down very well but um, that's what she did. During her time in prison Anne did go on to rebuild the relationship with her sons. It will never be as it was but they are speaking she um, has seen her grandchildren and she has some aspect of a relationship back there. Something which the father doesn't seem even remotely interested in doing. Um, now, he is currently living in the Philippines. He is 71 years of age now and his wife is 48 years of age. Very recently, his wife said that he was traveling to help the Ukrainians in the war against Russia. That's where he was on his way to, but he's recently been pictured um, very close to home in the Philippines, so that seems to have been concocted alongside the release of this British um, TV show based around what happened. Um, the couple did have to pay back everything that they owed. They now have no joint assets together. Um, John paid back basically nothing because all of those assets were in Anne's name but she was forced to pay back everything she owed. So they, they haven't financially really gained from the experience. 
Um, they have just become worldwide infamous for the brazen cheek of faking your own death and your picture appearing on the internet in Panama. Um, and that's the story behind The Thief, His Wife and the Canoe, guys. A uh, really interesting one. I didn't go into massive depth about it. There is a lot more information which I didn't want to like bog you down with, but that's the basic story. Um, there have been complaints about people from the local area about accents used in the show. Certain things things are called like um, I think regional accents have been used that are not accurate. So if you're from the UK or from that area, obviously I did want to raise that as a big criticism about the show. Being from Northern Ireland, I myself wasn't personally aware of that, but it's it's definitely something they should have worked a bit harder to get right for sure. Um, but the story itself is just so so interesting, guys. Um, let me know what you think below in the comments. Um, just balls of brass is the only thing I'll say. Honest to God, but what parent in the right mind is going to allow their kids to feel that their father has died? That at the bottom of all this, as amusing as the whole thing is that they did this and they got away with this for a certain length of time. And I think had they been smarter, they could have completely got away with this. But to do this to your kids, that's the serious side of this. Um, but yeah, that's the one I wanted to share with you this week. It's, it's very on trend as it's on telly at the moment. So um, let me know your thoughts in the comments, guys, and I will try and get back to you with another Based on a True Story episode um, in the near future. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Overnight, friendly to us.